everyone, this is Pastor John. And I love this time of year. I love this season. And I don't like fall, but I like football season, or football season, I call it. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a Bears fan, as some of you guys know. And uh, we were good in the 80s. Don't hold it against me. But every year uh, during this time, I miss football because I used to be a football player and used to play the game in, in high school. But I had a career ending injury. And a lot of people don't know this about me, but I had a, uh, it was more of an emotional injury than, than a physical injury, I could say. But uh, uh, I was in high school and, and we played, uh, this is a big rival of ours um, in Butte, Montana. It was a double A school. And so we go there and, and there was only one thing to do in Butte. And Butte's kind of like the hairy armpit of Montana, I call it. And uh, there was only one season there and it was football season. So the entire town shows up for these big football games and we were in Butte and we we're gonna play against this team. And, and it's always a tough crowd. It's always a tough team and uh, physically. And it's just, oh, it's just crazy. We're going there, you even had to have police escorts into the stadium and, and we were playing, I was playing the line. I played offensive defensive tackle. And so um, I'm playing offensive tackle and, and, the, and the guy that I'm going against is coming at me um, is just just kicking my hiney all over the place. I mean, he is leveling me and uh, getting to the quarterback had so many sacks and the quarterback's yelling at me and saying, you need to you need to hold your ground. The coach is yelling early, don't get, you know, don't get mowed over, just hold your ground. And, and, and this, uh, this player is just taking me to task. And uh, we ended up getting uh, getting killed. And this is at the end of the game. We still lined up. They had sportsmanship back then, and and we were shaking hands and going down the line. And this is where the injury happened. As we were shaking hands, uh, the person I was going against, she took off her helmet. And yeah, it was a girl. And. Uh, in fact, uh, she was also a wrestling state champion because nobody wrestled her. She actually, for, they all forfeited, so she was state champion wrestling too. But uh, she was an amazingly tough player. That's all I'm gonna say. But after that moment, I figured I'd just stick with basketball and I think that was a career ending uh, injury to my soul more than anything. Uh, but every season, it reminds me of this one verse because you see this verse from the Bible more than any other verses during the football season. And in fact, you'll see it uh, in crowds, you'll see it um, painted on signs and painted under people's eyes. And, and uh, it's John 3.16. And in fact, I think uh, the NFL is the official sponsor of this verse and, and you can't rebroadcast this verse without the written consent of the NFL because John 3.16 is everywhere. And there's a few pictures, obviously Tim Tebow makes this one famous. And uh, there's also uh, super fans that have it, this guy here, you can see. There's also this guy, which I think is amazing. Uh, this guy actually is getting tased by a police officer holding the sign, John 316. Now that's a diehard Christian. I really believe that if you've never been tased for Jesus, you've never really arrived at, at being a Christian. Now, that's a real Christian right there if you get tased for Jesus. Um, but we've all seen it, right? We've all seen this verse, John 316. And in fact, many people know it. Many people have it memorized. Um, it's the official verse of the NFL, official verse of football season and crowds. And, uh, but yet, if you really look at it, uh, we're going to take a look at it tonight um, or today or whenever you're watching this out here. Um, but John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will never perish but have eternal life. I've, uh, I've been a pastor for a long time and I've preached a lot of sermons and I've preached a lot of books in the Bible and yet I have never preached on this verse. I've never taught on this verse. I, I've shared it in sermons and, and, it's, and it's a core, a foundational truth. Um, and I think part of the problem is uh, as we want to talk, everybody knows this verse so we automatically assume everybody just has a knowledge of what this verse really means. And, and lately I've been really meditating on this verse. And this verse is probably, it's so simple, so many people know it, but I really believe if you break it down, it has the deepest theological mysteries of all, of, of, of all the books in the Bible and of all the verses in the Bible. It is so profound, it is so deep, yet it's so simple. It is so miraculous and so wonderful. It separates us as Christians and Christianity from all other religions in the world is this verse and, and the meanings behind it. And, and so I think it's so profound and, it's, and as God has laid some of these truths, I, I just wanna share it. And so let's just start and kind of break this verse down. It says, for God so loved the world. 
And, and that, little, that little phrase, so, just jumps out at me, right? He said he so loved the world. He not just loved the world, he so loved the world. Now there's a big difference be between loving something and so loving it, okay? I think I got a couple pictures I wanna share with you, and I wanna I want ask you guys the questions as you look at these pictures. How many of these guys so love the sport, okay? Or so love their team, okay? This guy right here. I would say that this guy so loves his team, right? If you're gonna do that. And then there's this guy. If you're gonna wear a coconut bra and celebrate a team, you so love that team, okay? And then here's a super fan. Now this guy so loves his team. He doesn't just love it. If you're gonna get dressed up like that, this guy for the, loves the Colts, right? If you're gonna get dressed up like that and paint your face and wear all this stuff. And the funny thing about these people, that's that these fanatical um, fans out there for these football teams, you've seen them, they paint their chest, they have signs, they dress up, they go crazy. We've all seen them. And uh, the funny thing is a lot of these guys are like doctors or lawyers or, or they're professionals and they just, they're just super fans. They so love their team. God is a super fan of us. That's something that I just want you to soak it in, right? Think about it. God so loves us. He's tailgating every Sunday, just, just waiting for us. Every day, he's cheering you on. He loves us. And the word love in the original language, and, and some of you guys know this, but um, the word loved in the Greek, the original language that the Bible was, the New Testament was, or New Testament was written in, um, Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, but the New Testament was written in Greek and Koine Greek. And in, in, in the Greek, the word love is translated four different ways. So when we translate the original language into English, we just use the word love. But there are four different words for the word love, and those four have four different totally meanings. Okay, and uh, I know this gets kind of confusing, but let me use an example of a word that we all know in the English language, the word fine, okay? Like, um, if somebody asks a guy, how you doing, and the guy uses the word fine, there's one definition, okay? So if my buddy say, hey, hey John, how you doing? I'm like, well, hey, I'm fine. That means I'm great, I'm good. Everything's, everything's good, I'm good. It just has one meaning, but if you ask a, a woman to use the word fine, there is so many meanings to that word, all right? There is like, fine can really mean, I'm really, really angry with you, okay? Fine to a woman can mean, even to the point of, I want a divorce, okay? It can even mean, I'm fine, I don't wanna to talk to you, that can mean that. The word fine can also mean murder, in some occasions, if you do stupid things again. Uh, the word fine is like, you better realize really quick what you did wrong and fix it. It could have that meaning. Or in the rare occasion, it could be, hey, I'm good, okay? You understand what I'm talking about. Just that word can have many different connotations. And so the word love in the original has many different connotations, all right? There are four different biblical words for the word love from the original language. There is storage love, which is family love, Okay, it's love that you're born into. Some of it's like sibling love, okay, that's not romantic, it's not, you just have love for your brothers and sisters, maybe maybe some of you don't, but there's family love, okay, that's one word that, that the Greek uses. But then there's another one, eros love, that's translated love, and that's a sensual or sexual love, that, that eros, okay, there's an eros, it's, it's, it's sensual, that's one that gets blurred so bad today. Then there's phileo, Okay, that's another word for brotherly love. Okay, we get the word Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. That comes from the Greek, phileo, okay? And that's brotherly love. And that is, that is a two-way street. And most of us understand this love. And in fact, most people's definition is phileo love, having love that goes both ways, it's reciprocated. But then there's one crazy love out there, and that's called agape love. And that is exactly the word that's used in John 3, 16, for God so super fan agape the world. <laughs> I mean, that's an amazing statement. Agape love is absolutely unconditional. This love does not come natural to us because, and I can prove this, 
Because how hard is it to love somebody that doesn't love you back? It's very difficult. And in fact, you can love, but oftentimes in any relationship that we, we have a loving relationship, we want it to be reciprocated back. Agape love, I really believe outside of God is completely not natural to us. We want love to be reciprocated. And yet God unconditionally, one directional loved the world, agape, unconditional. And this is just blows my mind because he loved the world knowing that the world doesn't love him back. There are going to be people that don't reciprocate that, but it doesn't matter. He is such a fan of us. Agape love is amazing. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 and 40, um, he uses another phrase, um, another agape love, and it says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, Love or agape the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and all your mind. And 38, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is this, Love, agape your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. I really believe true agape love outside of God does not exist. I believe it only comes from God. And he says, I want you to love me. Just full on, super fanatical love towards God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself, even if they don't reciprocate it. Uh, that's a pretty powerful. And this is why I think some people have a hard time understanding God's love because we filter everything through how the world views love, whether it's more eros or phileo or brotherly love or sensual love. We, we, we feed off that and so we, we translate um, God's love the same way and we have to understand that if we all loved agape, just think of the church loved God agape and love the world a lot of times we love God and we're so cool but then it's like if we're going through stuff that we don't agree with then we're like oh why are you doing this to me God we challenge it it's it's conditional and he's like love me unconditional whether you have a good day or bad day whether things are going well or you're struggling love me and I will love you back and then love your neighbor as yourself without condition that is very difficult very difficult and then he goes on to say so for God so agape the world. This world, word for world is cosmos, actually. And in this context, it literally means this, and I'll read the definition. The ungodly multitude, the whole mass of humanity, humanity alienated from God and therefore hostile to the cause of Christ. How hard is it to love hostile people? It's incredibly difficult. It says he so loved the world he's still a fan of the hostile sinful world and this to me is where we as a church as Christians need to understand the love of Christ and he wants us to have that same love and how often do we judge people and we push them out and we say you know uh, we judge them based upon their looks or, or their status or who they are and and we don't love them and we hold them at a distance and God's like, no, he never did that. He never held us at a distance. He never held anybody, even a hostile world that hates him. There are people that will never, never reciprocate love to God. And yet he so loved that, wow, he gave his only son. He's such a super fan and he so wants us to win eternally that he sent his only son, Jesus, to die. I mean, that is love. I mean, I look at my neighbors around me and I go, would I sacrifice my kid for one of them? My, my, my only daughter, would I sacrifice her for them? I don't know if I could do it. And that is how radical love God has for us. That he sent his only son as a sacrifice for us because of our sin nature. <laughs> That's amazing. And it says that whosoever believes in him will never perish. Whosoever means there are no limits. It's not a group of people. It's not like you have to do these rituals and these rules and, and he only likes good people. It's like that whoever believes in Jesus will never perish. But never. Whoever receives that love, it's a gift of God. For the wage of sin is death, but the death with the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's amazing that the God of the universe, and this is where I want to close today, just for you to meditate on this today, that the God of the universe, think about this, the God of the universe is your number one fan. So I challenge you, if you're struggling with sin, 
want you to hear him cheering you on today. If you are battling depression, he's already won and he's got the big megaphone in your life saying you can do this, you can get through today. I'm cheering you on and he is yelling. He is painting up like a super fan. He's got his chest painted with your number on it. If you're tired of the fight of life and maybe you're just struggling today just to get through, he's holding up a sign cheering you on. If maybe you've been hurt by love and the worldly love and the definitions and how we treat each other and maybe you've gone through broken relationships and hurt, he's loving you unconditionally through it. You have somebody that, that, that is loving you no matter what. And all your failures, he's cheering you on. So this fall and this, this, uh, this uh, football season, whenever you see that verse, I want us to think about God being our super fan, that he so loved us. God bless you. We're praying for you. Have an awesome day. Uh, go in peace. Thanks for watching.